Uh, I don't want anybody pitching anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, April 7th, we're going to do, uh, I believe it's two baby dedications, is that correct? How many? Three. Four. Wow. wow. Four babies. Um, and I, I, I would like to consider, and if anybody objects, you can object. I, I, it's family feast also on that day. I would like to consider staying after church or having some people stay after church. <clears throat> and go through, and we need to start painting and cleaning some stuff up. We It's spring clean kind of thing. We have doors that need to be painted on. They're, you know, all stained. And So those of you that would like to stay on that Sunday afterwards, April 7th, uh, we're going to clean and work on the church a little bit. You're, you know, you're getting a meal out of it. You're getting a sermon out of it. Or at least four baby dedications. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're invited to help do that. Um, oh, the phone numbers, uh, the list of phone numbers, and thank you, Sherry, for typing that up. Uh, the list are back there at the table if you would like a list of the phone numbers. If you uh, see any that need to be added, um, go ahead and do that and submit it to Sherry so we can just keep updating it as we need to. <clears throat> um, the movie night thing, I'm thinking at the end of the month, which the end of the month is the 29th, is it not? It's a Friday, I mean. The Friday is the last, okay. I'm showing up. If I sit here all by myself and watch a movie, I'll do that. I think we ought to do it like maybe 7 o'clock. Is that okay? If you want to come. You have any movie suggestions, you can always text me. Bring your own junk food. I'll bring some. And uh, we'll have fun. The other thing I want to bring up is um, we still need to change that box at the back of the room that says prayer box. We need to, I, I'd like to put blessings on there if we can. And then I encourage you to get in the habit of writing down on a piece of paper something that happened in your week that was a blessing. Date it. You don't have to put your name on it if you want. Drop it in that box because at the end of the year, I want to go through that box and I want to look at what everybody had go on this year and just kind of document how God has blessed us throughout the year. My wife does it. I've told you all before. She has a jar at home that she does. Um, and it's fun. I want to read you something uh, after we pray. It's uh, And I wanted to point this out specifically. Charner had a book of sermons that his father, uh, he's had more, I think. I think he had more than one book, but Charner had a book of sermons he had uh, from his father's days as a pastor. And I want to read you just an excerpt from one of his sermons. What's neat about it is the sermon was probably done between the 40s and in the 50s in that range. So that's how long ago this was preached. I have been reading through these sermons Charner knows this, but I now know it. His father was a very fine pastor, great preacher, did a great job. And uh, I may even steal some of his sermons. <laughs> Listen, pastors steal from each other all the time. You just think they don't. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see, what else do we have? I think that's pretty much it. So try and keep keep that in your mind. We'll post it on the website. It's on the calendar at the back, everything that's going on. Um, now, we are going to pray today. And when we do that, then I'm going to explain what you have in your hand, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. Again, it is not the sermon. <laughs> so let's uh, let's pray. Lord, I know that you are teaching us as a people, as individuals, that prayer is critical. I know that in the past month you have heavily emphasized uh, to me the importance of it and what the neglect of it actually can produce. So, Lord, I, I do want to pray for those people that are in this church 
our family. I want to pray that whatever is going on in their lives right now that is causing them havoc, whatever disruptions are occurring, the Lord, you intervene. You put it in check. Unless it is you moving us in the direction of greater obedience. Lord, I pray that we would grow, not because we just want people, but I pray we grow for the right reasons. That our obedience becomes more focused, our leadership in the church becomes more focused, and we actually are investing ourselves in worshiping you, honoring you, and serving you. I pray for those family members that aren't here today. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom, that you give them understanding, that they learn that feeding the soul is far better than feeding the flesh. Lord, I pray that you keep them safe. Caitlin, I pray she's doing okay at school and you take care of her. Haley, she's at boot camp. Kendall, who's off at school. Lord, just protect them and keep them. Thank you for the fact that you have forgiven us, that you offer us the opportunity to have life, that you offer offer us the opportunity to know you and to experience you. Again, I pray today that you will be glorified and honored. And those that don't know you in this community, Lord, again, bring them into our lives so we can encourage them towards you. We pray for Tyler and his struggle, his wife. Lord, I pray that you bring them to a point of understanding that you will not let them go. Thank you for Shane and Bree and the baby. Lord, I pray you keep them. We ask this according to your will. Amen. That sheet of paper I gave you, it is an explanation to help you start understanding how prayer actually works. Um, Lots of people are confused about prayer. A lot of people give you misinformation about prayer. I suggest you go read the verses that are printed there. This is kind of your homework. And really sit and think about your prayer life. One of the big mistakes in prayer is that you ask for things that are selfish and materialistic in nature instead of asking for the will of God in your prayer. Too many of us are overly concerned with our physical needs and wants. Not enough of us are concerned about our spiritual condition. Your prayer life should consist of praying immensely, a lot, about your spiritual condition in your heart in reference to the things of God. The way you pray does identify your understanding of who God is. So my goal here is to try and encourage everybody to learn to pray. I'll just drop things in periodically to help with it. The other aspect of your life that you need to work on that's critical for your life is something that Tim and I are working on very intensely, and that is living a life that is worshipful in its nature. Not just a Sunday morning sing a song. That's praise. Worship should be an outwork of your life. It should be who you are. It should be a daily, hourly, just you are God's. And, you know, you look at yourself and say, that's my father. You belong to God. So, my suggestion to you today is take this very seriously. Because I can promise you, Scripture confirms it. Prayer changes your life. It really does. Worship changes your life. All right, having given you that very serious, <laughs> solemn, I want to take you on a walk. We're, look at your life this way. And we're get, we've been talking about 
uh, finding our purpose. We've been talking about changing patterns in our life that are destructive instead of life producing. We've been discussing this a lot. I'm going to show you today where Jesus does a great job of giving us a picture of what what we're talking about. I love the stories where Jesus is brought up and where He's talking. I don't know about you all, but I have yet to tap out thoroughly the communication that is in certain parts of Scripture where Jesus is saying something and I, I still look at it and go, wait a minute, I never caught that. I never saw that. That's cool. You see how He talks to you where if you're not listening you won't hear it. If you're not looking or searching, you'll just read it and see it as just being Scripture instead of truth. And truth, I heard Ravi say today, truth, and I think it was the guy who uh, invented or helped Russia develop the nuclear bomb. Yeah. He made the statement that he thinks the most dangerous thing or the most powerful thing ever, and I'm not doing it justice, is not a bomb, but truth. Truth is it. You're going to see today that Jesus is going to communicate to us two very solid truths. And I think it's going to be fun, some of it. Um, Simply because when you go and you see something new, it starts taking on a new clarity. So, Alan, take me to uh, Matthew You've seen this story a bunch of times, but we're going to break it down. When he entered Capernaum, Capernaum is where Peter and one of the other guys in his group lived. They were there a lot. A centurion, and those of you that don't know, a centurion was a Roman soldier. Uh, They usually had about 100 people that they were over in leadership. A centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. He's a Gentile. What most people don't think about is at this point in time in history, they didn't have medicine like we have now. People died in mass numbers, the loss of babies was immense. You had people dying. You had most people not even making it past the age of 20. They had all kinds of disease, pestilence, genetic disorders, all of that's going on. The Jewish people were not allowed to be around death. They could not enter a Gentile's home. One of the main reasons was because people had died in that home, and that home was not ceremonially cleansed. This centurion knows this. means he's been paying attention to the Jewish people in the Jewish belief structure. Note one thing specifically. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Was the defiled home of the Gentile an issue to Jesus? No. When it comes to salvation, it's the same thing. The defiled individual is not an issue. Jesus will come to you in your defilement with the intention of healing you or saving you. So he says, um, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. Note this. The word. There is no... I thought of this for you, Tim. You made me jump and jive. There's nothing magical happening here. There's no laying on of hands. There's no ritualism. There's no over-spiritualizing it like a lot of people like to do when it comes to praying for someone to be healed. There is no bells and whistles. It's the Word. The Word. See it? But only say it. Say the word, Lord. 
and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority. What does the soldier recognize? The authority. He understands that Jesus is doing all that He's doing. And again, remember, your Scriptures do not record all of the things that Jesus was doing. I honestly believe, and I'm not the only one, there's a lot of commentators, he, everywhere He was going, everything was changing drastically. He was healing people in mass numbers. I think people were probably waking up in the morning going, man, I'm not stiff anymore. Oh, Jesus must be in town. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. He recognizes that Jesus is operating from an authority. This centurion, everything he does, he does knowing that it represents Caesar. He has the authority from Caesar to do what he does as a commanding officer. That is why he's making these statements. He understands leadership. He understands authority. Don't miss that. He recognizes that Jesus can do what He does just by His Word. He understands the authority of Christ. And surrounding Jesus, we'll talk about it a little bit, are the religious. And the centurion is a Gentile. He's a pagan. He said, I've got soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to the other, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, don't miss it, he's surrounded by religious people. He is surrounded by people who could probably quote the Old Testament to you. He is surrounded by a lot of Jews, very few Gentiles. He is surrounded by the religious. He is surrounded by people who believe that the practice of ritualism is what church is about or what God is about. They are pre-focused, most of these people, not on really the fact that Jesus the Messiah is here and by His Word... Instead, they are thinking, well, we've got a feast to go to and we've got our little ritual altars to build and we've got all these religious things we need to do. He's amazed, marveled. And the people that are following Him are standing there. The word truly is a word that means absolute. Amen. Truly, meaning fact, non-movable fact. Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Now, think about what he just said. Or let's insert Christian instead of Israel. One of the number one problems I find with us as Christians is we don't believe in the authority of Christ as we should. The centurion does. We don't. We're the ones that hang out with Jesus all the time. We're the ones who go around and say things that sound spiritual. We quote Scripture. We learn Scripture. But truly, I tell you, faith, belief in God's authority. Go to the next. I tell you, many will come from east and west. You know who that is? It's us, the Gentiles. And recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews. You seeing this? Want to see something new I found? They're alive. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Afterlife. Jesus is speaking as if they're, they never died. And He's saying, you Gentiles, 
coming from the east and the west, you're going to recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're going to become one under me, under my authority, at my table. See it? Yes. Yes, Dan. In the kingdom of heaven, you live on a planet where you have two kingdoms that are colliding. You have the kingdom of Satan, this world, and then you have the kingdom of Christ. And they are always crashing into each other. You're always dealing with that other kingdom, resisting the kingdom that Jesus is establishing in your life and in the lives of others around you. The effect of the world on you is based on how you perceive the authority of Christ in your life. Don't miss that. The more you understand that Jesus has absolute authority in your life and over all things, the more you understand that and submit yourself to that, the more you are going to be be able to endure the colliding that occurs from this world. And then he talks about the people that are the religionists that really don't know. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, he's speaking of Israel, those that reject the Messiah. They are the sons of the kingdom. But they reject it. But don't miss this. Your life reflects by your behavior, your actions, your desires whether or not you are living as sons of the kingdom, the true sons of the kingdom, or whether you're just really somebody who's just walking around, just following Jesus haphazardly and not committed to His authority in your life. You're either just there, or you're really pursuing the kingdom of Christ in your life. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is separation from God. You have no idea what that feels like because you've never, anyone on this planet has ever been fully separated from God. That only happens after you die if you've rejected His salvation plan. Adolf Hitler didn't even experience it until he died. And I can tell you, you were created to have a connection to God. Every human being was. When that connection is severed, You want to know what it's going to be like? Go back to the cross where Jesus was calling God Father and then when He was separated for that moment in time, He said, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? He split. For the first time in Jesus' existence, He experienced being separated from God. Another sermon. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Now, see the word believed? See, this has nothing to do with anything magical. That's the problem with people that like to try and make a big deal out of healing and all that stuff. Look, this has to do with what you believe about Jesus. This has to do with how you perceive His authority in your life. This has to do with how your relationship with Him is. That's what this has to do with. This is about coming to an understanding. Again, I've said it so many times, and the reason why I say it so many times is because I know it is the worst thing in every one of your lives. What you believe. It is either your greatest blessing or your greatest curse. It is either what God has said is true, or it's what somebody else has said, or whatever. What you believe determines your life. It's a very serious thing. I'm going to say this anyway, and I I thought about not saying it. And I'm going to say it at risk, and Alan will probably edit it out. (laughs) My week was decent until... Thursday. Now I'm not a person. I'm not a person who is um, 
I don't know the word other than to say fanatical. I'm not caught up into uh, demonology and all that stuff. That's not my thing. I don't. I know a lot of people that that's all they want to talk about. But I've got an individual that works for me, and uh, I hope he doesn't listen to the sermon. Um, he called me, and we had about an hour-long conversation. <clears throat> and I knew this about this individual. His belief is is that God is the Creator. You don't call Him God. His belief is is that Jesus was not the Messiah. His belief is that there are five portals in space, and out of those five portals are five angels that guard these portals. One of the portals is wisdom, one of them is health, and the other one is secret, and he doesn't know what secret is yet. And his belief is, is that man was put on the earth first and foremost as a spirit, And then God created him into a man. And he goes down this whole line. As he was speaking to me, he went from being the nice guy I know to becoming very aggressive, very intense, as he was propagating, almost in a prophetic form, his belief. I watched a video this week where John MacArthur rebukes Joel Osteen. And he makes a great point. And I want to help you get this. When you go to the temptation of Christ, the focus that Satan has is offering Jesus materialism. And Jesus rebukes it and says, No, I live by the Word of God and what it says. Everything Satan does when he goes to Jesus and tries to tempt him is exactly what prosperity teachers do. They use the same methodology. Either you are listening to the doctrine of a living God, and I'm being very bold here, or you are listening to the doctrine of demons. It's that simple. And their goal is to deceive you. So I called a pastor friend of mine and I said, I I noticed something about this. This guy was talking with authority, almost prophetically, with immense confidence in what he was saying. And I said to my friend, I said, what do you think of that? He goes, it's real simple. Study the scriptures. The demonic world still thinks it has authority and a right to you. So when they do confront you, they will confront you as if they have the right and the authority to tell you how to think. Don't think for a minute that that ability or that mindset that they have is not powerful enough to dissuade you to think incorrectly. Don't think that a demon who is propagating Scripture in his message doesn't have the ability to steer you away from the truth and the authority of Jesus Christ in your life. Do not be deceived, we are told. So, that was my intense thing this week. Very difficult. You need to know that they come into the church. There are people that will come into the church and try and convince you that they have spiritual authority and they will talk to you as if they have spiritual authority. You have my permission to be bold and say to them, no, I'm not interested in hearing this. I'm not worried about them leaving or their feelings being hurt. Do not let somebody who comes into your life who you know in the heart of your heart that something's wrong here. You be bold and you call it out and stop it. Okay? Because I've I've had that happen too many times in too many churches I've been in. And a lot of Christians get it in their head that they've got to be Christ-like in that moment and care for that person. And they don't understand that, no, sometimes what that person needs is not for you to be kind, in a sense, but to be honest, truthful. I will not listen to this. I know people who do that very well. Okay. Now, not done. Take me to the other Matthew. 
Scripture. Okay. Everybody has read this one. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Take note of this. Both men, both people in this illustration Jesus gives, heard the word of God. Both people that are being spoken of here have heard the word of God. One of them in the illustration did the word of God. And their house stood because the foundation was based on truth. Not opinion, truth. A lot of Christians I talk to in my life base their belief in everything on opinion, what they feel, what they want to feel, what they want to experience, and they won't go to the heart of the truth. And then their world start crumbling. Now, we get attacked, but there are a lot of people I know in the church Their lives are crumbling because they have made decisions to not, to not do what Jesus says. Now, having said that, I want to read to you what Charner's father said. And this is really good. History repeats itself because men repeat the mistakes they have made. We are human beings and are prone to make mistakes. It is a serious thing when a man makes a mistake because that mistake may bring with it results that he never dreamed of when he made his choice. Yet men have not learned that they must bear the results of the choices which they make. Somehow we think that we can play with fire without being burned. We think we can defy the laws of nature, the laws of God, the laws of health without paying the penalty. God has placed us in a moral world, and if we choose to violate the wisdom which God has given us, if we choose to make our decisions on the basis of gain rather than the basis of God, we must be prepared to bear the results thereof. (laughs) That is so good, Charter. I love that. I wish I had said that. That is so good. But it's absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. I would spend a lot less time on the phone with people counseling them if they would simply accept the authority of Christ in their life and move in the direction of obeying it. From my heart of hearts, believe me, my life proved to me early on that you do what God says to do, you win. You don't do what God says to do, you lose. It's not anything else other than that. It really is a matter... And it's funny how many Christians I've talked to that have gone down the bad roads like I did who came into doing what God asked and they go, man, my life is so much better now. I don't know why I wasn't doing this earlier. Sin is so deceptive. Opinions are so deceptive. Feelings are deceptive. God's Word is absolutely true. It proves itself over and over. You know, I like what John MacArthur said. Uh, Alan showed the video Wednesday night. I like it when uh, Shapiro says to him, philosophy, and John MacArthur stops and says, wait a minute, I don't believe a philosophy. I believe this is truth. This is revelation. Every Christian in this room needs to think that way. We're not following a philosophy. This is the truth the most powerful thing on the planet is the Word of God. It is the truth. And it should be evident in your life that you believe the truth. It it just should. And the more you bend your knee to the truth, the more your life is going to be conducive. Because everything I've been preaching for some time now is to get us to a point of believing right, 
having the right hope in the right thing, to have a life that is well lived, a life that God would have you live, to move out of dark thinking, dark living, sinful living. It's not that God's up there going, man, I just don't want anybody doing any of this stuff because I want to spoil their fun. No, it's a fact. You don't do these things because it hurts you. That's it. it he's fine. It's you, us, that have the issue, and that's His motive. It's, it's, come on, guys. Follow me. That's why you see Jesus going, I am utterly amazed at this centurion. Did you hear what He just said to me? And then He makes that statement. My people, the sons of the kingdom, they don't think like this. You have to ask yourself, I did. Do I think like the centurion or do I think like the ones that are wandering around with Jesus and part of the kingdom, but I'm not really believing in His authority or His plan. Belief produces hope, peace, joy, or your belief will produce death, darkness, pain, and heartache. His intention in creating you was for you to enjoy Him. Are you enjoying your Lord? Are you enjoying that relationship with Him? Or are you just tolerating life? If you're just tolerating life, then what you've done is you've let the world's kingdom collide with His kingdom and it's causing you issues because you're not properly focused on which kingdom you're actually in. I know very fine believers who will feed the flesh of their children and not feed their souls because they think feeding the flesh is more important than feeding the soul. I get it. I get it, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. The questions in your life should not be, will God keep His promises, but will will we build our lives around those promises? Don't lose that one. Question is, will God, he's, I, you should not question God's promises. You should ask yourself, am I building my life around His promises? If you're not, then you're disappointed, frustrated, confused, angry at Him. Don't understand what's going on in your life. All of that's going on because you're not building your life around His promises. Get in the habit. I'm going to give you a couple at the end here. Get in the habit of putting Scripture verses all over your house that are promises that God has made. And you stand on those promises. You stand on those. The other problem we tend to have, and the centurion did a great job with this, I'll just say it. Uh, The centurion believed Jesus could. There is no response in reference to would Jesus do it. So you've got this man, and this is important to you as believers. The centurion knew that Jesus could heal, could do. He didn't know if Jesus would do it. You need to understand that sometimes when you pray, you need to, you, no, every time actually, when you pray, you want to pray in terms of, I believe you can. But I also trust you if you don't. Which means, if you don't do what I know you can do, then I'm going to believe you anyway. I'm going to believe in your authority anyway if he doesn't do what you want him to do. That's the right way to approach your Lord. Why? Because He tells you you can trust Him with your life. It tells you in your Scripture that if He says no to you in a prayer, there's a good reason why He said no. And you believe in Him anyway, in His authority, even if He says no. And you trust whatever course He takes you on. You trust Him with that course. The centurion understood this. He knew that Jesus could. He did not know He would. And that's hard. 
Because I know there's a lot of people out there that try to preach, if you name it and you claim it, you get it. That is not true. You wouldn't give your kids everything they ask for, would you? Why would God do the same for you? Why would He just say, oh, well, I know they won't give their kids everything they ask for, so I guess, you know, God says, okay, I'll give you whatever you want. That's what Naaman claimant believes. That God's just going to give you whatever you want. That's not logical. Because a lot of times when He gives you something you've demanded, you end up wanting to give it back. And He knew you didn't want it. You just thought you did. So you trust God to provide. You trust God to be the one that's going to intervene in all areas. You trust His authority over your life and you surrender yourself to that authority. It is the answer. To any problem you have, it is your answer. I still have time. I know you're going to sleep. What you choose to believe becomes your reality. You can believe all wrong, and it will become your reality. It almost becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Write these verses down. I'm going to start your list. Romans 4. 18-21 18-21 Hebrews 10 23-25 Hebrews 6 verses 18 and 19 If you need those from me again ask me after church Yeah, this is something for you to start working on in the area of promises and belief Hebrews 6 verses 18 and 19 What separates the wise men from the foolish? Both people heard God, but only one does what he hears. I'm going to give you this last statement, and then I'll wrap up. I've been reading a book by Max Licato, and it's been pretty fun. This is a statement he makes in reference to the guys building their houses. I thought this was pretty clever. Two people set out to build their houses. The first went to RPF Home Supply. Regret, pain, and fear. RPF. He ordered lumber that was rotten by guilt, nails that were rusty from pain, and cement that was watered down with anxiety. Since his house, since his home was constructed with RPF supplies, every day was consumed with regret, pain, and fear. The second builder chose a different supplier. She secured her supplies from Hope Incorporated. Rather than choosing regret, pain, and fear, she found ample promise of grace, protection, and security. She made the deliberate, conscious decision to build a life from the storehouse of Hope. Isn't that good? What a, the guy's such a great writer. The question you have to ask yourself, the question this church has to ask itself in reference to its ministry, what are we believing as a church, as individuals, as family members of a group of people? What are we believing? What is propagated in our church, in our home, in our own lives? Are we people that are living dead Are we life producers? The only way you're ever going to reach the level of receiving the blessing of living out your life well is from obedience to the person who has full authority over you because he bought you with a price. That is your answer. I can give you all the psychology, I can give you all the counseling, I can give everybody all, you know, That is not going to solve it for you. What is going to solve it for you when you choose to bend your knee to the full authority of Christ in your life, as we all should be doing. There is where your life comes from. There's where your love comes from. There's where your relationships develop. It's all there. Why would you keep believing the lies of the world? They have produced nothing that is true. Nothing. And they're running around frantically now trying to figure out how to take their false beliefs and make them work 
and you are seeing us just gradually go down the tubes morally. Like I said last Sunday, suicide's off the chart for young people. Why do you think that is? It is because we've destroyed for them the authority of Christ in their life, and we have given them everything else they want. Which is exactly what Satan offered Jesus. You remove God from a child's life, you are killing them. You neglect God being in your home, you are killing them. I had no other way to say it. Along with yourself. You are. You are. Restores authority in your life and in your home, and your life will change, I promise. And it starts with prayer, and it starts with learning how to worship God. I've said enough. You all wore out again, all beat up, and in pain. Let's pray ourselves out. Lord, thank You for teaching us. Thank You for the commitment that You really do care. I know You wouldn't speak to our hearts. If You didn't, we'd just be playing church. But obviously, You very much care about the people in this room and Your desire is for them to know You. For us, Lord, I do pray for this church. I pray for the leadership in this church that we would be spiritually healthy people that this ministry would grow from our obedience to You and not from the bells and whistles. Lord, I do pray very intently that You maintain the stability of each individual in this church, that You comfort them with Your words. And again, thank You so very much for letting us have a relationship with You. Amen.